This tended towards the creation of a spiritual elite. You know, the ones who would know the secrets as opposed to the ones who wouldn't. And to be frank, this elitism is already present in the letters of Paul. Paul, who in his letters contrasts the sons of light, the children of light, with the children of darkness. It's the same terminology that the community at the Dead Sea, who produced the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's the same terminology that they use. They always refer to themselves as the sons of light and their opponents as the children or the sons of darkness. And Paul uses exactly the same uh, terminology in his letters. You know, you're children of the day, not children of the night. Uh, and of course, there has been an enormous amount of debate. You know, did Jesus know about the people at the Dead Sea? Did Paul know? Well, of course they did. It's a tiny country. You know, of course they knew who these people were, but it is interesting that some of the terminology of this group at the Dead Sea, uh, whoever they were, uh, finds its way, for example, into the letters of Paul. They saw themselves, of course, as a... <laughs> Jacob! <laughs> Jacob! Whoa! Uh, they saw themselves as a spiritual elite, and, and Paul, in, in a sense, encourages this in his, and it's all about, you know, foreordaining, foreknowledge, and, and election. Gnosticism did not encourage martyrdom. Uh, because if the flesh was irrelevant, what did martyrdom matter? Mm -hmm. uh, and in the second century, it influenced the mainstream uh, or what would become normative Christianity with this glorification of Christ. It is Jesus, for example, in the uh, first letter to the, in the letter to the Colossians, it's Jesus who will conquer this phrase, the powers, the dominions, and the thrones. Remember that in Gnosticism, the seven spiritual spheres are ruled by archons, and they have to be passed for the soul to reunite with the celestial realm. Uh, and Paul, of course, if, if he did write Colossians, which is not terribly likely, uh, but there is this uh, grouping of powers, dominions, and thrones. Uh, when I was doing my PhD at St. Andrews, there was a group of us, we formed a society of powers, dominions, and thrones. I can't <laughs> think of what we did. I <laughs> do remember that quite a lot of the time was spent in the bar at the Cross Keys <laughs> on Market Street, where maybe powers, dominions, and thrones uh, it, the, the, there used to be a, a you know, the, when I was growing up, of course, the, the, the paddle steamers on the river Clyde were still very prevalent, and, you know, we often sailed on them. And, of course, everybody went down to look at the, at the engines, you know, the great big pistons mm -hmm. driving, driving the paddles. But the bar on these steamers was always next door to the engine room. <laughs> and uh, the great joke was... Where, where's your father? Where's your father? Oh, he's a warden to look at the engines. He's a way down to look at the engines. <laughs> to which the embittered wife would reply, I threw the bottom of a glass, threw the bottom of a glass. So. <laughs> uh, one character I wanted to introduce is a chap called Valentinus, which has nothing to do with St. Valentine's Day, <laughs> but he flourished around 140 to 165 uh, AD, and he's a, he's a good example of generic Gnosticism. You know, God is one, he's unknowable, he's <laughs> utterly transcendent, bless you, uh, and creation is made by pairs of concepts and virtues. And Sophia Wisdom is the last of these. She falls into the realm of matter. She gives birth to the Demiurge, 
who is the one that creates the material world. And so, as, as we saw last class, the material world is bad. And so, for Gnostics, they regarded the God of the Old Testament as bad because he created the material world. And they tended to ignore the Old Testament uh, almost completely. Uh, there was a chap called Marcion from Sinope uh, who created a kind of odd Christian scripture that kind of blanked out most of the, most of the Hebrew Bible. And so in Gnosticism, and to an extent in what would become normative Christianity, freedom lay in knowledge and ignorance meant slavery, where the material world became less relevant. And this is very important for us because the heresies that we are going to look at sometimes incline to the idea that Jesus is more of a spiritual, thank you, Jacob, that Jesus is more of a spiritual than a material being. And the great conflicts of this period are how material can we make Jesus? Or how spiritual do we, do we make Jesus? Uh, and this is why, and, and Scott asked me to say why I consider this period important, uh, and, and worth spending a lot of time on, well, it is precisely for this okay. reason, because the church would then come to uh, <coughs> what we will come to at the end of, of uh, our, our talks next Sunday, the idea that the divinity and the humanity of Jesus must be held in absolute balance, neither one overwhelming the other and each uh, each extremely relevant. Uh, otherwise, Christianity doesn't work, but it's a very delicate balance. Uh, but this is what the patristic age does. It struggles to come up uh, with this balance. And so it's not just, you know, the, the speculation of scholars, you know, uh, having a good time rather like the Inklings, uh, you know, Tolkien Lewis and, and the others in, in the Bird and Baby pub in Oxford. It's, 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 a, it's a matter of the survival of Christianity. What we'll also see is that um, even after the church appears to come to some kind of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That appears to some kind of, of uh, let's do it, we'll, we'll just have to live without it. Um, I don't know if you'd print some of these off for the. Yeah, we have yeah, some. We have. We have some. <laughs> well, no, not, it's number four. It is number four. Oh, yeah, well, that's fine. Can I borrow it then? <laughs> If I was a Roman Catholic, I'd cross myself. <laughs> but, but my grandfather burns and my father would turn in their grave, so I better not. Um, well, uh, so, so sin from Gnostics is lack of knowledge. Sin for the Orthodox is lack of will. Gnostic Christians believed that the spirit of the spirit side of Jesus descended at baptism. And this is, you know, this is very important. How soon does Jesus become God? Uh, is it a baptism? Is it before baptism? Is he pre-existent? And all of these things which, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people seem to think are unimportant, are absolutely vitally important you know, during this uh, patristic period. For example, the heresy of, of uh, docetism, the Greek verb dokain means to seem or to appear, uh, was very powerful, especially in North Africa, where Jesus only appeared to be crucified. He only appeared to have a material body. And it was very appealing. Uh, but the mainstream church 
would come to say that if he doesn't have a material body, then salvation is irrelevant. It doesn't work. You know, salvation is through the material life, not through some secret knowledge. But if you read the account of the Quran, uh, crucifixion in the Quran, it's docetist. It's a docetist heresy that you know Muhammad had clearly picked up somewhere uh, on his on his travels. And so the debate, the debate on the Trinity, kind of began in earnest around. Uh, 200 AD, and it will end with the uh, Council of Constantinople uh, in 381. And this is the period in which heresies go from becoming different opinions to becoming wrong thinking. But what we'll also find out is that a lot of these heresies survive. Uh, that there, there, there is, there becomes a standard. Uh, but if you follow uh, the history of Christianity, a lot of the heresies that we'll meet are. Uh, are always waiting in the wings. <coughs> you know, like the understudy waiting for the principal actor to collapse or, uh, or something nasty happened to them so that they can go on. But there is always... Um, the, you know, the, 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 the idea of, of foreordaining, foreknowledge, predestination always totters on the edge of a Gnostic heresy. Uh, that, you know, if you know that you're saved, uh, I always say to people, look, I'm Presbyterian, I'm a Scot, I'm middle class, of course I'm saved. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but, but, th but there you are. Uh, and there's a marvelous novel by uh, an 18th century Scot called James Hogg. He was a shepherd, rather like Robert Burns was a farmer, but again, self-educated. He wrote poetry, he wrote novels, and he wrote the Confessions of a Justified Sinner. And it's an absolutely marvelous book. It's one of the books I read once a year. Uh, and it's about a rather dissolute young man, the son of a son of a preacher. He, uh, he 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 has a brother, and he's a rather dissolute young man. But he believes that he's saved. And it's like the Cather heresy: if the body doesn't matter, you can do what you like with it. You can either become a total ascetic, or you can become someone who just really enjoys life and leads a rather dissolute life. And he does this. Uh, he's miserable to people. He you know, gets girls pregnant. And, and the end of the novel is really um, very stark. He's in prison in Edinburgh waiting to be hanged. And he thinks he's going to be saved. Well, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit like uh, Don Giovanni at the end of Mozart's opera, Don Giovanni, when the commendatore comes back from hell and summons uh, Don Giovanni into, into the underworld. He suddenly realizes that at the very end that he's going to hell. Uh, and it, it, you know, it's a, it's a novel that counters um, this idea of foreknowledge, election, uh, predestination. I, I think I mentioned, you know, Holy Willie's Prayer by Robert Burns last, last, our uh, last meeting. But it's it's a marvelous book, uh, James Hogg. Uh, you know, Scottish poets uh, and novelists around the time of Burns all suffer from not being Burns, just the same as a whole lot of really adequate composers suffer from not being Mozart or Beethoven. Uh, and so Burns tends to. To, over, to whom I'm not related, uh, tends to over, overwrite uh, these others. But it, it, so it's, it's an idea that is always 
uh, prevalent in the church. And so uh, it's important for us to understand these things. So any any questions before we start we start our our heresies? <laughs> when I uh, uh, in my first year of my BD at, at Glasgow, Morigius professor of church history who taught this period in our first year was <laughs> one John Foster. He had two counts against him. He was English, <laughs> and he was a Methodist. <laughs> uh, he lived uh, he lived uh, down on the Clyde coast he came up three days a week by by steamer and train uh, to take us through uh, the patristic period why he had been appointed remained a mystery to us he was no great scholar he, he did little popular broadcasts on BBC Scotland uh, he had produced these little books like Five Minutes a Saint, to which we always refer to as Five Saints a Minute. <laughs> and he was a nice man. He'd been a missionary in China. And during class, he would break into Chinese hymns with the tears streaming down his face. You can imagine how a group of big lump and Scottish boys took this. <laughs> so I, I bought Leitzman, whom I'd listed, Hans Leitzman, and I read... Hans Leitzman. I always went to class, but I was reading Hans Leitzman <laughs> under my desk. I was not always the nicest of uh, Professor Foster's. He was replaced, and of course, Jacob and I have chatted about this. He was replaced by, by W.H.C. Friend, another Englishman, but you know, a brilliant scholar who wrote a marvelous history of early Christianity. After he left the Regius chair, like so many of these chairs, fell victim to the modern world. And uh, there are no religious chairs at any of the Scottish universities anymore. It's very sad. So I'm sorry, Professor Foster, but here we go. So we're going to start with monarchianism. And why do I call this a fun heresy? Well, it's fun because it provides us with a group of beliefs that will feed into uh, the uh, final big heresies like Arianism and Nestorianism, which we will look at in our final meeting. So what is monarchianism? It's a Christian heretical document of the second and third centuries AD. <clears throat> And it opposes the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity that within the Godhead, there are three separate hypostases, three separate persons. It, it opposes this because it wants to maintain the unity of God. And this is, again, as I've said to you before, and will likely say again, is one of the problems that Judaism has and Islam have has with Christianity, that this apparently breaking up of the Godhead. And so monarchianism was intended to reinforce monotheism in Christianity. Now, what monarchianism did was it raised the question of who suffered on the cross. Now, if God is an absolute unity, if, you, if, if he can have three, um, three sort of presentations of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but if he is an absolute unified being, Who suffers on the cross? Does God suffer? Mm -hmm. So monarchianism in its first emanation is what is called, uh, if you have that in front of you, patripassian. From pater or pater in Greek uh, to uh, for father, and of course pathine is to suffer. 
And so does God suffer on the cross? There is no, there's no dualism or even Trinitarianism inherent in the divine. Uh, and the Patropassian group taught that God the Father had come down to earth, he had been crucified and suffered under the appearance of the Son, but it was really God. So this is the first uh, emanation, in a sense, of the monarchian heresy. I mean, it's called monarchian because, you know, God is, God is king, God is monarch. But, but, but God suffers. Uh, and by, by about AD 217 to 222, uh, during the reign of Pope Callistus, it had reached Rome. It was very popular. And it had reached Rome. Uh, remember that at this time, the power of the church still lay in the east. Antioch, uh, Alexandria uh, were the two power bases of the church, and Rome was was uh, you know less important. The bishops of Rome would like to become more important, which they did. Uh, but the heresy reached Rome; it lost its fav favor, and Callistus excommunicated them. But they set up a rival church in Rome. They set up a rival pope. They didn't last, but it's it's an evident it's evidence of how important these quote unquote heresies were, how they pervaded the church uh, at this time, and and how. how significant they were even to ordinary people. Now, bless you, the oh, second yeah. group, I mean, my blessings are effective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're Scottish. Um, the, the second group of the monarchians were called the dynamists. Greek word, dominus power. Now, they said, that Jesus was born an absolute, ordinary human being. Nothing connected with the Godhead. No, no pre-existence, no sharing of substance or anything else. But, but, uh, divine power had been given to him at some point. Now, a subset of them were called the adoptionists because they regarded Jesus' baptism as the moment where this divine power was given him by God. And it's not an, it, it, it's not an, uh, an ineffectual argument because all of the Gospels see the baptism of Jesus as a big deal. And, uh, you know, the, the quote from the psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So adoptionism is not a bad idea. Uh, that the power descends on Christ at his baptism, it descends on him again after the resurrection, that the resurrection is the vindication of baptism. Uh, Professor Barclay, my New Testament teacher, uh, always used to say that, that he was a closet adoptionist. Um, and, you know, I, I, yeah, I find it attractive. It's, it's appealing. Uh, but again, it was designed by, by the group who thought like this so that the Godhead would not be split up, that the unity, the divine unity, uh, would, would be preserved. Mm -hmm. So monarchianism, does God suffer and die, which, of course, mainstream Christianity would reject the idea that... that that, you know, gods don't suffer. Uh, 
was Jesus just an ordinary person who had been kind of selected by God? But uh, yeah, the, the monarchianists had clearly read their, their Old Testaments because uh, throughout the Old Testament, there are all kinds of people like the prophets to whom God, you know, God chooses at a specific moment, gives, gives power, you know, to speak. Uh, but without dividing himself up. Uh, so it, it is an appealing heresy. And so the human is then uh, subsumed into the Godhead, very like, you know, the kind of Christology of the early church. There's no doubt that Jesus' first followers did not believe that he was God. They were Jews. They couldn't believe that. I mean, it's just not possible for them to believe that. Uh, but under monarchianism, Christianity could revert to being a Jewish sect again. Uh, and the adoptionists, the adoptionist section, <coughs> excuse me, the third section, uh, taught that Jesus certainly had a miraculous birth, but he was a mere human until his baptism. When the Holy Spirit, remember the Holy Spirit, descends in the form of a dove at the baptism, makes him the son of God by adoption. So if you scratch a lot of liberal Christians, you might find an adoptionist not lurking too far from the surface. Wow. And the... Uh, uh, I've raised this chat, Paul of, of Samosata or Samoseta. He was Bishop of Antioch between 260 and, and uh, 272. And he preached that Jesus was an ordinary man to whom the word, our old friend, the Logos, was joined at baptism. And he argued that Christ was made not from above, but from below. And ironically, the Gospels and other parts of the New Testament uh, support this position, uh, as they do other heresies. You can find all of the heresies supported somewhere in the New Testament. That's, you know, that's just the way it is. And the quote, uh, I have a quote from um, um, uh, Paul of Samoseta from uh, Stevenson's book, The New Eusebius, which I've, I've listed in, in books, which I also kept under my desk. Uh, <clears throat> For the word is from above. Jesus Christ is from hence. Mary did not give birth to the word. She was not before the ages. And Mary is not older than the word. But she gave birth to a man like us, though better in every way since he was of the Holy Spirit. Let me read that again. For the word is from above. Jesus Christ is from Hence, Mary did not give birth to the Logos. She was not before the ages. And Mary is not older than the Word. She gave birth to a man like us, though better in every way, since he was of the Holy Spirit. No unity between Christ and the Word Christ was not pre-existent, but was chosen at baptism and uh, at, at, at the resurrection. And of course, the mention of Mary is, is important because she will become a key figure in the discussions of Christ's divinity. Uh, what, one of the questions we'll look at in our last class next week is, you know, does, 
does Mary give birth to God? You know, is she pre-existent and gives birth to God? And, uh, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a reformed Protestant, um, that kind of bothers me quite a lot. Um, but it, uh, it she, you know, she, she becomes, uh, you know, a significant figure in these debates and, you know, remains a significant figure in the Roman Catholic and the, the Orthodox churches. So here, Paul, Paul of Samoseta is perhaps the most extreme of the monarchians, that there is no unity between Christ and the Logos. But Christ is only uh, adopted at baptism. And so the unity of God is not impugned in any way. Well, councils of bishops were called in AD 264, AD 268, and Paul of Samoseta was condemned as a heretic. And the council of the church appealed for the very first time the, the condemnation of Paul of Samoseta at these two councils is important because the Council of Bishops asked the then emperor, which I think was maybe Decius, but don't quote me, to support them. So for the first time, the church feels itself as important enough to appeal to the Roman civil power, which of course is the start of the slippery slope. It set a dangerous precedent for the future. However, despite the defeat, uh, monarchianism survived in the Eastern Roman Empire for many years. And it's this uh, type of thinking that is largely seen as responsible for the most influential heresy that we'll talk about next week, Arianism. I mean, monarchianism is the ancestor of the Arian heresy. We talked a little about origin um, last week, and there was a bishop of Alexandria from 247 uh, to 265, a chap called with the rather uh, unchristian name of Dionysus. Uh, <laughs> he was bishop of Alexandria from 247 to 265. And he, following Origen, who, as I said to you, is a much underestimated uh, thinker, he said that Jesus was in fact, the spiritual Jesus, was the word incarnate, pre-existent, but just temporarily assumed a human body. And so Jesus of Nazareth and the divine wisdom or the Logos who dwelt in him were really two figures, that there was this spiritual Jesus and then there was the body that he had assumed. Uh, which, you know, really, uh, which really confused the issue. And so there are two positions that emerge towards the end of this period. There is the church centered in Antioch in Syria. Now, um, this, the Antiochian church used Syriac, which is just a form of Aramaic with a slightly different script. Uh, the Syrian church still uses Syriac uh, and, uh, and the Aramaic script. I mean, it's a very small body nowadays. Uh, when that appalling Mel Gibson was uh, making his film about uh, about Jesus, he sent people to these remote villages in Syria that still spoke a dialect of Aramaic, you know, to, you know, for them to understand how Jesus actually spoke. Well, Jesus spoke Palestinian Jewish Aramaic, which has very little to do with 
whatever silly act sounds like uh, today, and all of these people said, you know, why do you want to talk to us? We want to learn English. <laughs> <laughs> As you can gather, Mel Gibson is not one of my favorite people. Uh, but so the language of the church in Antioch, and you know, some scholars argue that perhaps Matthew's gospel emerged in Antioch, uh, in Syria. But it, 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 it retained maybe a more Jewish view of Jesus, uh, linguistically, um, theologically. And at Antioch, they were less keen on the pre-existence of Jesus because they inclined to a more monotheistic position. And that, that was the, the church in Antioch, you know, far more powerful than Rome. Uh, Constantinople had yet to emerge. But it was the center of, of uh, the thinking that would lead to the Arian heresy. Now, in contrast, you have the city of Alexandria in, in Egypt, where the belief was that the word was present in Christ, both substantially and essentially, uh, not from the outside, not, not, not adopted, not at baptism, but, but always there. And it's the view in Alexandria that would prevail as normative orthodox uh, Christianity. And so the period uh, of the uh, monarchian cluster of heresies, I mean, it's not one heresy, it's a heresy with, with several faces. This period sets up for the, uh, the discussions of the great councils, the beginning with the Council of Nicaea that we will uh, talk about next week, the Council of Constantinople, the Council uh, of Chalcedon in 451, that will try to uh, produce a statement of faith that, that everybody will believe in, or at least everybody will be able to assent to. Uh, and so it's, in a sense, it's a struggle for the soul of the church uh, and, and its perception of Jesus. How important is it for Jesus to be truly human? I mean, if we're, if we're reducing it to simple questions, how important is it for Jesus to be fully human? Uh, how important is it for the Godhead not to be split up, but to be one? How important is it for Jesus to be a spiritual figure? And remember, we are still in the age uh, where these uh, uh, salvation cults, like the cult of Osiris, the cult of Mithra, uh, the cult of Attis, these are still appealing to people, the idea of the divine being that descends into the world, uh, imparts knowledge to their followers. And, and Christianity, by this time, uh, by, by the middle 200s is very noticeable. It, it, it's not, not the, 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 between 200 and 300, you have the uh, large persecutions of the emperor Decius, and then the final great spasm of persecution under the emperor Diocletian. So Christianity by this time is almost setting itself up as an alternate society within the Roman empire. Mm. Uh, the bishops of the great cities, certainly Alexandria, Antioch, Ephesus, Rome. Um, I mean, we'll see at the Council of Nicaea, um, bishops from the remote provinces of Hispania, Gallia, and Britannia, and there was no place more remote than Britannia, <laughs> uh, you know, came to the council. So the, the, the church is almost working as an altar and is very noticeable by, by Roman authorities. And it, it has this, um, it has the, 
you know, it has the appeal of a sect because there's, there's a level of secrecy about it. You know, you have to be initiated. There's a meal that outsiders don't uh, don't attend. There's a level of secrecy about it, and and there is a level of knowledge. You know, you you are taught how to achieve salvation. Gnosticism, uh, but a Gnosticism that does not reject the material world. And so, the, so you have this tension throughout this period. And of course, between 200 and, and 300, uh, although our last class will, of course, go beyond that, and I probably haven't done this period justice today, uh, given time constraints, but this period, 200 to 300, is, 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 is almost like a, you know, water boiling before you you know you you drop in the you drop in the pasta there's this great ferment of of discussion a discussion that is based not on um on faith and belief and how necessary is it for jesus to be human how necessary is it for me to find how do we achieve salvation is it by knowledge is it by suffering is it by obedience um are we preordained to be saved or are we preordained to be damned? And, and these questions bubble through this, this period and will issue, of course, in uh, the uh, great quote unquote heresies that we'll look at next week Arianism, Nestorianism, monof uh, monophys let me try that again, monophysitism. Uh, uh, that 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 we will look at and the questions that are raised between 200 and 300 are still are still raised raised in the church today the church is always um i mean the phrase jesus christ same yesterday today and forever well okay um but it's uh, it's a tension uh it, it, I, it's a sense of attention that gives that gives life to the church. Uh, so I'm now open for uh, questions and comments and violent disagreements. All these periods of changes came to 100 and 200 monarchism and monarchism appears after 200. <coughs> Oh, after 200. They, they're all previous re reactions to what our belief in God is, or combining of what it is today, sort of like. No, no, they're they're all their reactions. They're the, the pro, It's a very it's a very good question. He said, breathing heavily. Um, <laughs> uh, the first Christians, Jesus' first followers, have a reaction to him. Their followers have a reaction to them and to Jesus. And so it develops. But it's always about Jesus and, and the church's reaction and faith to him. And so different groups, and, and the minute the church... The minute the church goes beyond the confines of the first Jewish Christian community and exposes itself to the thought world of the of the Greco-Roman Empire, uh, and Paul is the example of this, that people who are coming into Christianity uh, and who meet Jesus, you know, by conversion, by faith, they have a reaction, but it's a reaction that is that is influenced by the backgrounds that, that they believe. And so this is why you have Christians who maybe come from a more Jewish background, you know, from Jewish communities throughout the Greco-Roman world who are concerned to maintain the unity of God. And I suspect they are behind 
they're behind the monarchians, for example, that want to maintain the unity of God. Then you have those coming in from the Greco-Roman thought world who have maybe belonged to some of these other cults where they expect a savior figure to descend from the celestial into the terrestrial realm uh, and, and bring knowledge of salvation. Uh, there's a very odd uh, little uh, book. I think it's one. Of, it's, I think it's the Epistle of Clement. I would need to look it up, so don't quote me. Um, where uh, Jesus uh, instructs a young man uh, in in secret knowledge. You know, they they spend the night together, and he instructs the young man uh, in in secret knowledge. And a lot of these Gnostic gospels that I talk to you about. Um, they're, they're knowledge gospels. They're, you know, they're, 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 they're gospels that don't have, for example, the great judgment scene where people are judged on, you know, helping the poor and healing the sick. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that, I suppose, is my answer, however confusing it may be. I had another one connected. Are you going to discuss Nicaea next week? Yes. Is that uh, sort of a combination of what we are believing today. Uh, God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'll answer that next week. <laughs> you might not come back if I answered it now. <laughs> Leave them laughing, sir, and then ma'am. Did, did all of these uh, sects and, and the Pharisees believe in the re resurrection of Jesus. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Without, no, 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 no. Resurrection is, is there from the beginning. That's not a controversy. Yeah. Resurrection is uh, not a controversy. So I always say to my students, when I talk about sects and parties in Judaism, I'm not talking about sects and parties. <laughs> <laughs> I think they would prefer it if I did, but there we are. I wanted to understand why they believe that God could not suffer. Why, why can't God suffer? Well, that's just because God is omnis omniscient, unknowable, unreachable, and he doesn't suffer. It's, I mean, it's a very good question. Um, well, it seems to me to limit God. God can't feel what we feel when we suffer. Well, yeah. And, and the, you see, it's a basic question like that that really is causes a lot of all of this. <laughs> People like you all these centuries ago were asking these simple questions, which of course then went into the hands of the writers and thinkers who nearly yeah. fudged the issue a bit. I mean, in a sense, we know what we believe, and, and uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, that's a, it, it, it's a basic question, and scholars are always fudged by basic questions. <laughs> yes, sir. You have implied that you've done away with Christmas. No, I've done away with Christmas. Yeah. That's your implication. But no, no, well, there's no Christmas in Mark, um, but uh, that doesn't mean that we've done away with it. Uh, we'll talk about that a little next, next week when we talk about the role of the, the Virgin Mary. Where is the New Testament canon in all of that? Ah, quite, that's a very good question. The... Um, We'll talk a little bit about, I think we talked about Athanasius, one of your fellow friends was doing his PhD in Athanasius, and, and he survived. He? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, Athanasius, in his, one of his epiphany letters, Athanasius was the Bishop of Alexandria after Alexander and was a great defender of what would become Orthodox Christianity. He wrote almost all of the time. I don't think he was a very nice person, but in one of his pastoral letters, he lists what is the New Testament canon of the twin, same 27 books that we have. And the date of the pastoral epistle is Epiphany 367 AD. So by the middle of that century, then, the, the, you know, and, and obviously it had happened before, you know, just, just the same as it's around AD 100 that the canon of the Old Testament is recognized. So that's that's the Athanasius. That, okay. Because there was considerable discussion yeah. about what's in and what's out. Mm. Yeah, there was some, I can't remember which of the Christian fathers wanted to get rid of. Well, Luther wanted to get rid of Revelation. 
He thought it was a very confusing book. <laughs> he didn't like it, and he didn't like the letter. He, he didn't like the letter of James because it referred to good works. He called it Ein Strohendes Epistel, a letter of straw. <laughs> Thank you very much. We look forward to next week very much. Thank you. Thank you.